podcast i'm rudo that's eric that's megan that's aj that's all four of us but we will also have miles wood on the show a little bit later so stay tuned for that it's day one of training camp are we allowed to say hockey's back for day one of training camp does that count or did it already happen with the rookie face off or does it is it not till the season starts for me it's july 1st so <laughs> <laughs> No, I think last week, you know, okay. rookie yeah. face off for I me. Agree. Yep. Okay. All right. So hockey's been back, but now the actual Avs players are having actually organized things happening. Yeah, if they weren't if Landy's not around for captain's practices, are they what still are captain's they? practices? <laughs> <laughs> Alternate captain's practices. Right. I don't know. <laughs> Not sure on that one, but they're not a thing anymore. They're are doing they, real practices. Are now. they just guys skating <laughs> under supervision now? <laughs> Papa now supervised by Papa. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it was an interesting day. I think obviously a lot of new faces, certainly in the forward core for Colorado, that we'll go through. But let's let's start simple. Group one, who'd you like the most? Miles Wood. No, I'm just kidding. Cop out answer. Tomas Tatar looks great. Looks great. Yep. Dude seems like he fit in immediately. Right. And and you know it's training camp, so it's like you know whatever. It's day one. You know they're not playing real hockey. They're cool. running drills. Don't you know, take stuff like too that. much out of anything we say but on this show. Yeah, yeah. Outside of conditioning, in which the Wood yeah. Colton Tatar combination looked. Gassed by the end of their session. Uh, no, I thought I thought Tomas Tatar looked awesome. He he looked like he really fit in nicely. It, it's Wood said before we went live in the interview. He said, "Yeah, I've been here about two weeks. I'm still working on the I'm yeah. still working on the air out here." So, well, that's what I find impressive about Tatar's showing today is knowing that his timeline being in Colorado is close to what Miles Wood is as well, and he did look pretty good stylistically out there in terms of creation and i thought that was really encouraging to fit in so well newly playing alongside these guys yep all right i'll say druin look good your boy <laughs> hey let's go your boy druin you know i look good. i mean it's systematic practice right you know it's just mm. puck goes there this is where you go and you know, it's important to do it's in new faces and young kids and nowadays you got an exhibition game and 72 hours later right so I think it's important to touch on some stuff, and, and that's what you saw out there today. Well, look, when you uh, get dropped next to Nathan McKinnon and Miko Rantanen, you better look good. <laughs> Put it to you that way. You know who else looked pretty good? Who? Ivan Ivan. Hey! Our guy. I'm just saying. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to get anything started here. I'm just saying. I really like I, Ivan Ivan. I was curious how the skating would stand out in a session next to a bunch of NHL guys. And it did. It stood out to me even then. Because, you know, you, you normally see those guys come from rookie camp where the pace picks up, the skating is just so much faster. Everything is happening so much faster. And those guys, you're like, oh, my God, who is that guy? And instead, he was the one guy wearing green where I was like, who is that guy? <laughs> and saw the little 82, and it's like, dude, they, the guy was everywhere in Vegas. And I'm just saying, I liked him again um, in the in the morning session. So sign Ivan Ivan, sign Jeremy Hansel. We'll be done with it. <laughs> Look, if I have to sign one of them right now, I'm signing Ivan Ivan. Whoa. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that. I want to get Jeremy Hansel to the AHL. Yeah. Ivan Ivan's there. True. <laughs> but I liked Givy Ranta from the first I group. I did too. I did too. Um, especially just given the circumstances of being a PTO guy. And then... Back to Wood and Colton specifically, what I liked is the effort that they played with. Both weren't worked off the puck easily and were fighting for rebounds. And I thought, I like to see that level of effort. I would be concerned if I didn't. But I liked it because I could already see 
what they're looking for in that line. Jared Bednar talked about heavy forwards and seeking that heaviness through this offseason. It was a necessary addition because in losing Manson parts last year, in losing Valnichushkin parts last year, they were missing some heaviness in their lineup, generally speaking. And I think that's been replenished in Wood and Colton. And I can already see in training camp how that is, if that's how that line sort of shapes out, going to be a line that's difficult to play against. When you do see how that difference is uh, in kind of the remaking of it, Alex Newhook and Dennis Mulgan from last year, two skill guys who are not going to play those those kinds of heavy games that you really, really want in your bottom six especially. And you see you, you see Wood, you see Colton, you see the effort. First thing, you see the size and you say, okay, these are just much bigger humans. But then you see the effort that they also are working with. And yeah, these are just, this is just practice. This is just camp. It's just drills. But you can already see that part of their DNA and say, okay, this is what, this is what makes sense. I get, I get it. It's, it is interesting, right? Because I look, Wood and Tatar did play get together a little bit in New Jersey, but you're essentially having an entire line come into Colorado that is brand new to the organization. And and I did think it was interesting that the they grouped them with the majority of NHL guys mm-hmm. and kind of just let them go. Kind of there wasn't a ton of Bednar going over and saying, "Hey, this is exactly how we run this system that yeah. thing or the other thing." It was kind of a lot of just they go with the flow, they pick it up from the other guys on the ice and and let it run. Well, and one of the other lines from that session was the Dallas Stars cast off. Yeah, it's true. Which I I don't know about you guys. I thought it was really interesting. All of them were together. That you had Riley Tufty, Frederick Olson, and Kiviranta. Yeah, uh, Kiviranta all together. I thought like this is the ultimate like. You know why dudes think about the Roman Empire all the time? Because <laughs> the coach just set up a little gladiator right. arena for You're them to go in. You're all in competition with exactly. one another. Exactly. <laughs> Good luck. Battle together. <laughs> but also, you have to play with each other now. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to separate from that guy, but you also have to succeed with that guy. So, you know, it's kind of fun. So, so reset the... Day since I last thought about the Roman Empire. Back to, zero. Back to zero. How many? How often does it get past one? Let's be honest. Not that often, man. I think about it all the time. Uh, well, now we're thinking about hockey all the time again. Now that the season uh, is back on. True fact. I never stopped. <laughs> not wrong. It's not like we do a show five days a week about it or anything. <laughs> uh, look, you, you go into a training camp like this. Where do you set expectations for someone like a Tatara would? Because we're saying, hey, they look great out here, but it is just drills. It is just yeah. a practice, essentially. Is this a, hey, they look great in context, or, hey, this is a guy that could maybe push their way up the lineup? Well, I, I think you'll see a lot of combinations, right? I mean, For I, sure. I mean, it is what it is, and today it's like, oh, this is what works for today, and they'll get the report the medical report then it's going to be different you know like oh god so we can't do that tomorrow now you know because we had to change it and that's a nightmare for coaches because they got everything ready yeah he's got his lineups ready for sunday he's got his lineup ready for monday don't kid yourself he does right. I, I mean it is what it is i mean you know within a guy or two or you know it's just there's so much logistics you know what i mean to so everything's kind of done and and then but but also as a staff they you know they want to see Use the big names like you know, they want to see Drew in with McKinnon and Brantman. They want to see Wood with Tatar or whatever. You kind of saw that a little bit today. You can read into that a little bit as far as the rest, not to downplay all the other guys, but sometimes it's just like, oh, you want, why not? Let's put the three Dallas castaways together. Why not? Let's, you know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? Yep. And then I hope they play on the line together no. so we can just call them the castaways. Yeah, the, castaways. <laughs> the misfits. Um, but no, no, I'll respect everybody. But it's, you know, it's different. But I think to your question, like if you're coming into training camp, you want to do well on the ice. You want to, first of all, you want to see if you feel good. Did I do the work? You know, if you've done the work. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know what I mean? I forget about the altitude that, you know, whatever. This is all equals out after a couple of days. But those guys are such well-oiled machines. But they know you want to feel good about your game. You want to feel good about yourself. You want to develop some chemistry. And then it's not just on the ice. Um, for a guy, you know, 
take Tatar. Cause forget about Wood because we'll talk to him. But take Tatar. You know, he, he comes to the rink here. This is different. He's not used to the training staff. He's not used to the medical staff. He's not used to what do I do after practice? Is I, I'm not even sure if Thomas Tatar is married or whatever. Is he all set up right now? Is he all you know? Is everything all ready for him to take away the excuses when the season starts? You're ready to go. So. It, it, it does make a difference. You're going to go on the road. You get to know your teammates better. You spend some time with them. And how do you mesh with those guys? Yeah, you walk in the, this room and the culture, and we'll talk about it later, but you want to make sure you fit in the culture too. You know what I mean? So it's not like, wow, I stuck out like a sore thumb. It's probably not a good thing, right? You know what I mean? So I think it's important in training camp that all those aspects of your game fit and get in place together, you know, it makes me, it makes you feel more comfortable. So I think a lot of guys, cause there is a lot of new guys, you know, it's, it's important for them to, plus you get used to a new coach. Every coach is different. Don't kid yourself. They ask them too, like, how are his practices? How is it? You know, this coach is that are notorious for longer practices. And so you kind of get to know a little bit what to expect. The assistant coach, a video guy, right. You know, like what, what can he be there for me? Like, where can I use him where I better my game? And so everybody's different. Uh, every team's different. So I, I think for those guys, it's very important. Training camp is, is a big get to know you, get to know me few weeks. And I think it's important. All right. I want to move on to the guys that are fighting for one of the last few, if not the last roster spot here. Megan and I already said we liked Kibi Ranta. Did anyone really take a step into that roster spot today? Did someone like Peter Holland do something, Frederick Olofsson, that you liked? You could even argue Sam Alinsky should have that spot for whatever reason you want, if that's what you believe. Or is this uh, well, wait until preseason games? I mean, it's interesting to me that Curtis McDermott opens as, as a forward. Yep. A forward, especially there's no Kel McCarr on the ice, right? So there's, like, space there uh, for defensemen. For him to get looks there and for, you know, depending on how health is going to be, for him to step into a defensive role. We've kind of had him earmarked all off season as the seventh defenseman. Yep. But if he's not, if he's not the seventh defenseman, they're not even looking at him like that right now. And they're saying you're the 13th forward. It becomes a lot harder for Ben Myers and Frederick Olofsson and Riley Tufty and all these guys, Peter Holland especially. All these guys, they're, they're Kibi Ranta. All of them, their job is that much harder if Curtis McDermott is the 13th forward. Yep. But it then opens up the conversation of, well, who's your 7th D? And so I thought on day one of camp, knowing that the forward group is a lot deeper right now than the defense group, him starting at, at forward was interesting to me. I allowed myself 10 whole seconds to believe. They could weigh them. Maybe yeah. they'll allow somebody else to make a team. Maybe Ben Myers and Frederick Olofsson will make this team. And Curtis McDermott won't. They'll try and pass him through waivers. And, you know, if he gets picked up, he gets picked up. If he clears, he goes to Loveland, you know. I don't actually think that's realistic. I don't think that's going to happen. They've made zero attempt across two seasons now to do that. But this was the first time that I, I allowed myself to at least wonder. Are they whatever they value? And Eric, I know that you love the guy. So whatever they value about him, that is not about what he does on the ice. Because on the ice, there really isn't much of a conversation. He was not good last year. Two years ago, you could say, look, he, he took a pretty big step forward from what he had been with the Kings. Both at forward and on defense, where yep. you were, you were like, "Look, he's pretty passable. It's hard. It's pretty hard to argue about it." Last year, big steps back. Forward defense did not matter. He was bad. And when they're trying to raise the floor of this team, you know, you do look at a guy like Curtis McDermott, and and, and I would wonder, is what he does off the ice still so valuable that the competition that they have brought in for that spot does it still make up that difference? Is, is what AJ saying spelling out on the wheel of fortune board? Sam Malinsky's going to make this team. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I, the prediction I had is based upon Josh Manson being so close, Malinsky being somebody that they can get up and down easily without contending with waivers. And for that reason, if especially because Manson is on the brink of returning so soon, 
They don't necessarily need a long-term fit there. Why not ride straight from camp and giving Malinsky his debut? But it's it's hard to say because it is really early, and I felt like seeing Malinsky in this environment, he was shaking off the jitters a little bit. I don't think he looked bad. I just think that you could see the different difference in talent level when he is playing opposite NHLers. And it's not that I didn't think he could hang. It's just there's a little bit more that I think needs to be revealed. But Bednar did say there's potentially a spot on D and two forward spots. He's up. He's willing to carry 14 forwards. This makes it all very vague then because everything that we're saying could be entertained yeah. under those guidelines. But it is interesting around McDermott specifically because we're talking about some of the heaviness that has been added to the forward group specifically. Does a Riley Tufty replace in the forward position what Curtis McDermott would bring, but in a better way? Absolutely. Can you justify playing McDermott over Riley Tufty at this point? I would say no. And that's just Riley Tufty specifically. There are players like Olafson and potentially Kivi Ranta that are more serviceable as NHL forwards that you could option there that makes so much more sense and bring value to the lineup that C Curtis McDermott were moving away from what it was that he was supposed to bring that other players can now potentially bring because this is, in my opinion, a group that is physically more imposing than they were last year. Yes. So are you saying that what McDermott's, his number one thing on the ice is his physicality. He's big, he's mean, he's scary. Um, with Miles Wood and Ross That's, Colton and yeah. all these guys, they've gone out and they've gotten bigger, they've gotten a little meaner, they've gotten more physical. So having him around is less important. Just like what he does on the ice is less valuable. And I would also say that part of his value is that you were getting two for one with him. You had a seventh D and a 13th forward on one contract. That was great. If they saw what the rest of the world saw last year, and that was a defenseman that was not playable at the NHL level, a guy that was actively hurting you every night when he was in that position – He's less valuable if he's just viewed as a forward now because that forward competition is real now. You know, Kivi Ranta is a PTO. You know, you look at his underlying numbers and you're like, hey, is this guy really serious competition? It's the same kind of guy. It's the same caliber of player as McDermott at forward. And so it's it, it, it I think it is an interesting all-around conversation of his value has taken a lot of hits with how the roster got constructed around him and with uh, just the year that he had last season. To include Ryan Johansson at the top of it, which now adds a little bit of grit to the top of the lineup, which was already there in Val Nachushkin yeah. and in different ways, Arturi Lekkanen as well. But they just got heavier from top to bottom. So that makes yep. it a little less important that McDermott breathe, be the grit on the fourth line. But they'll make that decision, right? Those are all valid points. I I agree. Um, you know, he, he didn't have his best season. Um, but I think as a staff, from coaches to the input of the players as well, and management, like they'll, they'll, they might come to a point where like, oh, we might have to waive a guy like Curtis, right? You know, do I think they're going to do it? No. Um, do I think he's going to have a spot in the lineup? Yes. Would I give him a spot in the lineup? Yes. Um, sell me. The, what's that? Sell me. Well, I, I know it's I, it's it's a hard sell. Like I understand that. It's a it's a feeling, you know. And, and I tell you, the the game has changed. Yes, it has changed, but it's, there's still an element there. And and I'll tell you one thing: when you're sitting there, and and you know there's a guy like that, there you just feel so much better. Even if you're Arturi Lekkanen or if you're Miles Wood, you know what I mean? Because it's hard to explain. It's, it's hard to put on paper. It's just a feeling like. I know that I got someone right there that is feared. You know what I mean? And you're going to say, yeah, but, you know, cheap shots have always, you know. Well, and it, I see that all the time. People it, say, like, the, oh, cheap shots were given, the thing even though, the, you know. The Mac mental side of the game is it doesn't yeah. matter what the reality is. It's how it makes you feel. Yeah. And, and he, <laughs> you know. What a sentence. <laughs> no, but it's, but it's true. Like, I, I, I'm being honest. Like, I, it's, it's easier. It's more a feeling than a description. You guys are so good at describing everything. You know, it's awesome, and I mean that. It's a compliment, you know. Um, but this one is a hard one. It's a hard thing for me to sell, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, because it's a valid question, you know, and, and, and I don't shy away from, from valid questions. I'm just saying I do take them, and, and, and if I have to, to do something. And, and, yeah, at times did he look bad last year a couple times? Absolutely, you know, and he would tell you that too. Um, 
I don't know, I've seen them, for example, a few years ago in L.A., like being part of their PK and do a good job. Actually, I have. And under Tom McClellan, and this guy's worked hard over the last four, five, six years, like to make himself into a player. And of course, his skill set is different than, you know, Nate McKinnon or Kale McCarr. We all know that. Yeah. Or Miles Wood, or, you know what I mean? He's different. And I think that, yes, he makes him, it, it, you put him on waivers, he doesn't clear waivers. I am telling you right now. So there is a value for him. Either. You know, there's a value for him. So if you do feel that, at that time as a group, like, okay, we have to keep, because <coughs> knock on wood anywhere, like, there's no injuries, and, you know, it's all funny today. It's, we know there's a list of injuries, but we all know who, I mean, Landeskog is the only one, really, I mean, that, if we look <laughs> yeah. at the list today, that would miss the open, I mean. Him and <laughs> Wagner, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Wagner, which is a new guy anyway, but, or Frankie, we know that, but mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a backup. I'm not saying backup's not important. I'm saying, yeah. you know, like playing, you know what I mean? Making an impact on the game, game one, which George Gorgia would be in that, right? So yeah. I think Mac is, I mean, McDermott, um, he becomes valuable for all those reasons. But, but yeah, I mean, you know, he is a forward. He is a D. He is a little bit, he's an ultimate team guy. Guys love him. I, am, I mean, there's, there's value to that in the locker room. There's value to... Um, I know it's different eras. You know what I mean? Let me ask you this. Is there such a thing as too much physicality on a team? Well, probably. I mean, there's some team. If you don't have enough skills and well, all you are, yeah, you're right. I, I, I know where you're going. I I'm, I'm saying yeah. remove yeah. the skill from it. Yeah. Is there such a thing as too much physicality? Well, probably if it's not under control, then okay. you're in the box, right? You know yeah. what I mean? that's. And, and you already mentioned the skill part of it. Yeah. So what it comes down with McDermott is... Can he keep himself out of the box? Yep. And can the skill level hit the floor that is necessary mm -hmm. to get the avalanche to where they need to be? Because the physicality is clearly there. Well, oh, yeah. And, and I think it's going to work itself out. It's either going to be we have to make a decision, like, you know, make them make this. It's no different. So if, you know, if he becomes the casualty, then they'll think about it long and long, long yeah. and hard. Uh, I can tell you that. You know, I, I, um, do any of us actually expect them to wave McDermott? I think. No, no, for me. No. I think the Colorado Avalanche operate less like a business compared to other organizations. And I say that very carefully because I think they still do operate as a business. But I think there is loyalty that they mm -hmm. build with their players. And I think that would be true of McDermott. I think they got – that's what makes them so good around the league too because they got the, the unbelievable players in number eight, number 29, 96, right? Now they're better at their, right, right? Colton, Wood, yep. they were missing that. Val, <clears throat> you know, yeah. again, Val was missing last year. We know that. I do love their decor. I do. Um, I really do. Uh, you, you got a little mixture of everything, right? Um, and and uh, I, Manson healthy and, you know, they got the, the big right shot that's mean and, the, you know. So we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Right. Um, I love their goalie. I do. They are tough. I mean, they can play with anybody. For sure. Um, and it's not about fighting, you know, but, but they can, I don't care. They won't get intimidated by Ryan Reeves or whatever it is. Yep. <laughs> so, right? I, I'm just using, you know, names. Especially not now. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, so I, I think it is, a, it is a weapon you have. It is a, hot, you know, a, a commodity or whatever you want to call it. And it's an element that some teams still look for it. Uh, intimidation is still part of the game. Um, Feeling good about yourself is very important. Uh, superstars do feel a lot better when a guy like Curtis McDermott's around. Um, Which I think is interesting because we do have the, the we have the exact example last year. The Avs in Pittsburgh against the Penguins. Mm -hmm. Jeff Carter hits Kale McCarr in the head. Yeah. Curtis McDermott's on the ice. Mm -hmm. Curtis McDermott takes the next shift with Jeff Carter and doesn't come within 20 feet of him. There's nothing. And so it's like, I, I think it's interesting because I know that this is still a real thing. I know that this is still a mental thing and that gets talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. But Curtis McDermott's presence, he was on the ice when it happened, was no deterrent mm -hmm. from Jeff Carter hitting Kael McCarr in the kid. No. It, it's Kael McCarr. It doesn't get any more big time than that, you know? But then the very next shift, there's no price to pay. There's no nothing. Yeah. Does that speak to uh, more to... The team last year was maybe not as tight knit, or was that more to, or or was it more of a uh, you know this is just not how the world works anymore 
Because if the answer is this is not how the world works anymore, what's the point? Is is my is always the question that I always ask. Good, no, good question. And, and, and here's what would be my answer. Um, back then, yeah, it, it's a diff- different game. Right? Totally. And, and again, totally. It, it, we are not living in the past. I'm I'm not that guy. I don't live in the past. Um, I'll live in the present. There is no more fighting. You're right. Um, but where I differ from people on this one is Jeff Carter, for me, Jeff Carter is not a dirty player. Jeff Carter is not a feared guy. Jeff Carter, I play against him. I'm not like, oh, my God, wow, i got to play against Jeff Carter tonight. It, it's, it doesn't work that way. So that incident there, yeah, it's a bad play. He doesn't know it's kill him a car. He does, I'm telling you. And then stuff happens. It happens. I don't believe it was on purpose. You know what I mean? I think it's maybe on purpose, meaning like, but it's like, like, you know, if I don't remember the play, but I remember the play. You know what I mean? So he puts his arm up, whatever it is, and bad things come, you know, for Kale, right? He gets that concussion, right, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. But and, and you're right, the next shift, and that's where it's a different era. But me, it's more about, uh, you know, we are playing a heavier team. We are playing a team with, you know, this guy, that guy, and that guy. You know, Max here, I feel better. You know what I mean? I do, and you do feel better today. 25 years ago, 45 years ago. Yeah. Some guys 45 years ago going in there king dry. It didn't feel good going into the Philadelphia Spectrum. <laughs> They're looking around the bench and like, oh, my God. I'm not, I know. And it, But it's changed. But now, like Jeff Carter, I'm not – he doesn't – again, man, we're all tough. Like, But he doesn't scare me. You know what I mean? Like, So it's not – I'm going to change my game because Jeff Carter's there. Well, you know what I mean? Still, though, isn't that – I mean, isn't, there, isn't that part of, like, the hockey code and the ethos is that – you know, a guy like McDermott exists to be like, okay, you touched one of my star players, mm-hmm. and I'm going to I'm going to inflict punishment on you for doing such a thing, and what, intentional or not, you fair, know, fair. he doesn't because it, it's not like there was a confrontation with a different teammate. There was no answering of that bell. And for me personally, I said, I, I've always like like this this role of Curtis McDermott mm-hmm. has always been a thing that I'm like, okay, I get it. I get its function, mm-hmm. but in in a situation like that, and the reason that I specifically remember it is because I went back and I watched it mul- through multiple times to see if there was a conversation mm-hmm. between the two, to see if there was anything, if anything happened at all, because it feels like that's what his role should be, and it feels like it didn't get met in that moment. Yep. And when we should bring this back to today and to training camp. If that's that, if if that's the reality of it, if he's not going to fight anybody, if he's not going to go after Jeff Carter, if he's not even going to have a conversation with the man, and yeah. he just he just took Kale McCarr out, whether intentional or not, then mm-hmm. I once again come back to what are we doing here? Yeah. Because as much as he seems like a great guy, and as much as we've allowed that he has been an unbelievably hard worker over the last two years, and that he's well loved in the room. Mm-hmm. If that's his role and he's not doing it, what are we doing here? Well, I mean, just to go, but just to finish off, sorry, like <laughs> situational wise, like, yeah. you know, I, I don't remember what the score was, what anything was. And you got to remember. It was you, a close game. It oh, was. Yeah. It Every was. point's so important. And, and you don't know what Coach Bednar said, too. He might have yelled at him, Mac, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and somewhere, somehow, it's his old teammate, too. So it's not like, you know, and I'm not saying, oh, because it's your old teammate. You got to remember yeah. the friends. You know, Jeff Carter's his friend. Kel McCarr's his friend, too, I know. But, you know, it might, oh, it's an accident. You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, Jared's like, hey, don't worry about it. We want to win the game. Don't worry about it. And Jeff Carter's not going to fight Curtis well, McDermott. And that's, the, that's why I was so saying, like, there he's wasn't. He's not going to fight him. There wasn't a, there wasn't a Curtis McDermott yeah. with anybody else either. It yeah. was just like, we just kind of moved on from it. And it's mm-hmm. like, if that's where the league is, I have no bones about that. I yeah. just, if you're using a roster spot on this person, for me, I'm like, I'm I'm trying to get uh, I'm looking at it as if I'm running a team I'm trying to get my team close as close to the Stanley Cup as mm-hmm. I possibly can. Is Curtis McDur- do- McDermott doing that for me in, in, with the last year's roster? He probably was. Right now in this training camp with with the group that they had this forward group and even I mean you look at the guy that's out there getting the opportunity was Corey Schuneman today next to Josh Manson. Is Curtis McDermott winning a job over any of those guys? Is it over Sam Walensky or Corey Schuneman? I don't know. That's what the preseason will be for. But I, 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 I know you're trying to get us out yeah, of this. I'm we, sorry. We got I'm just an interview saying, to get to. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just. This is, this is why I thought it was interesting today and why I wanted to bring it up. Because for me, this is now a storyline I do want to watch for the rest of the preseason. It'll be interesting. I, I, I do think it has wide 
grossing repercussions here is because it's now there's a battle for a defensive spot. Now there's a battle for is Curtis McDermott even holding on to a forward spot? Well, and if Megan says, you know, Megan, Megan mentioned that Bender says there's two spots up for grabs, that's Curtis McDermott's job. Yep. Both of them are up for grabs then. Exactly. And so I do think that this is a suddenly an interesting because they're up against it. They can't afford, you know, Curtis McDermott was great cost value for two roster spots at the price of one. And if they're not viewing him that way, he's in danger. And I think that it's really interesting, like, Obviously, we're talking about 13th and 14th forwards here. The abs are awesome. That's what we're going to be talking <laughs> yeah. about. Uh, if you want to get a sandwich that feels like two sandwiches for the price of one, Snurfs, go out there. Get yourself a delicious sandwich. They make their own bread. It's their own recipe. They bake it every <laughs> single day. It's absolutely delicious. If you haven't tried it for the bread alone, you got to do it. But they have all fresh ingredients every single day, too. It's just delicious quality stuff. All the way around. They also uh, have their new blend of hot gardenera peppers. I probably said that. I'm not. Nope. Moving on. Uh, classic Chicago style blend that's great on any of their sandwiches. So give that a try too. Uh, they also have a Snurf burger. If burgers are more your thing, there's three burger locations in Denver and Boulder. Just check that out. Just great food all the way around. You can get the Snurfs app today to get a bunch of discounts. You get five bucks off your first order of ten dollars or more from Snurfs. Uh, use code DNVR fans by September thirtieth when you sign up with the Snurfs app, and you'll get a Bogo seven inch sub too. So jump on that, get the Snurfs app, create a code, create an account. Excuse me. Go to the more section, click on coupons, and enter DNVR fans to get your Bogo sandwich. With Snarfs, also brought to you by the folks over at Fubo TV. You can get your best way to watch sports here in Denver at FuboTV.com slash DNVR. They have over 140 live channels. It's not just sports either. They've got shows, movies, news, live TV, all sorts of good stuff there. It's also the lowest price to get in on most Colorado sports. You can start watching immediately right now with a free trial if that's what you want to do. There's no contract. There's no cable. There's no hassle. You can just sign up and start watching today. Uh, and they give you a thousand hours of cloud DVR. So if you miss the game, you can always record it and watch it back later. That's so many hours. It's an <laughs> absurd amount of hours. Uh, full season in hockey is what? like It's like 400-ish hours, I think. Yeah, they uh, my Fubo subscription automatically records all the Rockies games for me. I don't, I didn't mean for that to happen. <laughs> it takes up but, a lot less space than uh, this yeah, year. But, yeah. <laughs> but even so, you look at it and it's like that bar is still really. Yeah. It's just like a game every day. It's yeah. so many hours. So you can uh, you can get in on that with Fubo. Uh, go over there, watch whatever sports your heart desires. Uh, FuboTV.com slash DNVR. Sign up there. Get fifteen fifteen percent off your first month of Fubo Pro. Second period of the DNVR Avalanche podcast. As promised, we talked to Miles Wood at training camp today. Uh, he was a really good interview, so I hope you guys enjoy this one. Tiff, you can roll the wood footage when it's ready. All right, we're here with Miles Wood of the Colorado Avalanche. First of all, Miles, thank you for joining us for this. You just in Colorado well so far? Been great so far. Awesome. We do have one fun question we ask everybody that comes on the show. I got warned about this one. Yeah, so. the bad food take. <laughs> I, <laughs> I give the my example. I like mayonnaise on burritos. So that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. That is wild, actually. I've so never heard of that. It's, um, nobody likes that take. So I got you covered. It won't be as bad as that. <laughs> the craziest food. I think I'm a pretty like normal eater, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing crazy for me, like, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. We, we did have one hockey player tell us he ate yogurt and tuna together. All right, that's bad. Yeah, <laughs> that's bad. That's crazy. That's bad. So, I've never heard of that before. Just pure protein, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> it I know. gets the job done. <laughs> nice pregame snack. <laughs> that's AHL budget, right? Canned tuna and a little bit of yogurt. Yeah. We've all been there, all right? It, it happens. Uh, all right. All right, we'll let you pass. We'll give you a pass on, right, the, on the food take for today. Um, I, I, the first question I got is the one I'm sure you've answered a, a dozen times this offseason already, but why Colorado? Um, first and foremost, when I was uh, talking to teams in free agency, um, the staff and the GM here, they wanted me the most. And that was the most important thing in my aspect when I started to look at teams and talk to teams is who wanted me the most. Um, because I want to play for those guys. And 
on top of that, it's a beautiful part of the States out here. Um, I have friends and family that live out here in Colorado. They all said that they're going to come out here for one year and they've stayed for 10. Um, so they've had great things to say about it. And um, the guys on the team have been great so far as well. So it's been uh, very easy for me. You specifically wanted a long contract going into the off season and beyond the obvious reasons for wanting term, I was curious what about a long contract was something of a non-negotiable for you? Um, I think if you ask all <clears throat> pro athletes, they want a long-term deal. Um, you know, I think, you know, I was in Jersey for seven years and, um, you know, I think for me, I, I wanted that lo long-term deal based on, you know, my age. Um, I'm starting to creep up there. <laughs> I'm only 28, <laughs> but in, in the hockey world, I feel like that's getting old. <laughs> um, but, uh, but for me, you know, the fact that, um, you know, C-Mac and the staff, um, they wanted me the most and they gave me term. It was the best of both worlds. So um, it's something I, I couldn't pass down. You played your whole pro career with New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know, turning that page, um, that chapter of your hockey career, what is it you're most looking forward to being a fresh start in Colorado? Yeah, you know, certainly um, tough to leave there. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm actually happy that I did. Um, you know, it's very rare that one player stays with one team throughout their whole career. Um, you know, for me, I, I don't like change. Um, so it definitely was hard uh, to part ways with a team that drafted me in 2013. It's, I was there almost 10 years or so, played for them for seven. So it was definitely tough. But, um, you know, the guys on this team have made it so easy to step in here and, and, uh, and just play. And I think, uh, you know, the guys on the team have been great. Um, and n now I know why they won two years back. The culture on this team is second to none. I've seen you play many times. Obviously, I know you can adapt to situations or line mates and um, something new this year, obviously, new team. Mm -hmm. Any indication yet of, you know, where you're going to fit in that lineup or or is it just attractive, like you said, as a free agent to just come in because there's so many options here? Yeah, when I was talking to C-Mac and Joe, um, you know, I'm not going to tell you what, what they said exactly, yeah, yeah. but um, <laughs> I, I will have uh, – a more impactful role uh, than my past years. And um, that was great to hear. And um, I, I just can't wait to, to prove them right and um, start up playing again. Uh, you mentioned Colorado was the one that wanted you the most. Did you have a handful of other offers out there in free agency? Yes, I did. Okay. Yep. I, uh, I, I, I have to know, Eric, I know your buddies with his dad. <laughs> <laughs> My buddies with him. His dad doesn't like me. That's fine. Why is that? No, no. I'll oh. get to it in a second. Oh, all right. It's a... <laughs> dad likes everybody. I know. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, you, you did end up playing one year at BC. I did, yeah. Uh, the Avs have had a, a couple of other guys go through that organization. How did you get your started contacts here in Colorado? Um, I know Alex Newhook. Yeah. Um, he obviously played it. Boston College. Um, he was a few years behind me. Um, I played with JT Comfort at World Juniors. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, I uh -huh. think that's it for now. But uh, but yeah, they've said nothing but great things about the team and um, the state of Colorado. Great place to live, and um, so it was, it was just a great fit for me. I was wondering if you could introduce yourself as a player to the Colorado fan base. What they can expect to see in the way you like to play hockey. Yeah, I think first and foremost for me, um, I like to play with speed. Um, this team loves to play with speed, so I think it's going to be an easy transition for me. Um, like to stick up for teammates. Um, I play hard, hard, hard nosed game, get to the net, and um, so yeah, I guess that's my game. <laughs> I have to get it out of the way. Seventy six <laughs> penalty minutes. Can you reconcile those minutes from last year? Is it a bit of an anomaly? Was it born from unique circumstances like frustration? Uh, I don't think it was born from frustration. I think I do like to play on the edge a little bit. Um, sometimes it does get me in uh, some trouble at times. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think I think I got two 17-minute penalties last year, so that didn't help. <laughs> so, That's half yeah. those minutes. Yeah, it's half <laughs> right there. So, 
Um, I think that was like a new rule that got put in place because I was not aware of that you could get that. <laughs> it was like a two for something and then a five and then a ten. And I was like, all right, here we go. Back, back to the dressing room. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's just a part of my game. So. You're, oh, no, go ahead. Ahead. no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. You're out there on the line, at least for day one of training camp here with uh, Ross Colton as well. Uh, how is adjusting to a couple of other guys that are new to the Avalanche organization? Um, yeah, I was also on the line with uh, Tuna. Um, yep. I obviously know him, played with him for the last two years or so, so I know what he's about. I know his game. Um, Ross, I don't know too much about, but um, I do know that he likes to play with speed. He likes to get to the net. Uh, smart player, and um, so it's going to make it very easy for me if, if I play with him. So. <laughs> no, what I was trying to say earlier, I don't dislike your dad. Um, <laughs> I'm your dad's age. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of yours. Um, you know, you, you went to Nobles. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I went to Govs. Oh, okay. 30 years ago. All right. Way long. My son went to Govs. He's, okay. You went to BC. My son's going to be next year. All right. It's um, rivalry. It's going. Right. You know what I mean? So, and, and then I played against your dad for many years. And I mm -hmm. did, I was telling these guys, I did admire your dad. Your dad was a smart player. But, you know, for some reason, I don't think he liked me on the ice, which is fine. <laughs> you know, that's where it comes from. So there's yeah. no, yeah, okay. There's no dislike towards your dad. Yeah, okay. Your dad was a hard nosed, respected yeah. player. I, I, you know, again, like I said, I, my whole career I played against him. So I, re re you know, remember your dad a lot. Yeah. But I uh, know. Being a kid from the East, like you are, like I said, same similar background, right. you know, prep school and college and yes. and the NHL. Now you're going to love Colorado. Yeah. I mean, I'm just telling you that I'm here to welcome you on behalf Thank of you. especially all of us here and then guys for like sure. the alumni and everything. So Thank you very much. you're going to love this place yeah. and can't you wait. can't go wrong to be here and whatever you need, especially restaurants, then I'm your guy. Okay. You know, all right. That's good to know. <laughs> he does have the restaurants down. <laughs> Cherry Creek's true. Know, a lot of them. So. I got you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> awesome. How does the atmosphere in New Jersey with a young, talented core compare to Colorado's young, talented core? Yeah, um, there definitely is a change. Um, you know, when I stepped in here day one, um, I, I felt it. Um, and it started with Nate, Landy, Miko, um, Kale. Um, they have such a high standard, and they want to win each year. Um, they're not satisfied with, you know, getting to the first or second round. Like, they want to win a cup. Um, you know, they've been a playoff team for years. Um, they won the cup two years back. So, um, you know, don't get me wrong. New Jersey will be great for years to come, but, um, they just don't have that culture quite yet, um, to push them to the edge. Um, and that's where I, when I stepped here, I felt it first day. And a lot of what Colorado seeks out in players that they target, and you are one of them, is a cultural fit. What is it about how you view culture that is so compatible with how Colorado views it as well? Yeah, you know, I think ho hockey is a team sport. And, um, you know, you can't have one guy trying to push the boat left while the rest of the guys are trying to push the boat right. Um, you all have to row the same way. Um, and you just got to, at the end of the day, you just got to be a, a great guy. And... Um, and you have to buy into the system. Um, you can't go rogue. Um, and that's, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm playing first line or fourth, fourth line. I'm still going to play my game. Um, I'm going to be happy when the teammates score and stick up for them um, when I have to. Um, but when it comes to trying to win Stanley Cups, I think the culture is a huge thing. Good. Good. All Good. right. Miles, thank you so much for coming awesome. on. We got you a T-shirt to say thank you for oh, coming sweet. on the show. We appreciate it a ton. Uh, we wish you good luck with the season. We hope you have a, a great awesome. year here, and we appreciate sweet. you. Sweet. Cool. Welcome. Thanks, guys. That was Miles Wood talking a lot about the ads. And I want to go to you, Megan, on this, because I know you talked about it with Bednar today a little bit, too. A lot of emphasis on culture from Wood in that interview. Yeah, I think from our perspective, this is, at least for me, the only team that I've ever covered. And so I have different feels for how different groups have been in the past, like with respect to players I've known growing up and what different college locker room atmospheres have felt like. And there is a difference in culture that I've noticed in that small sample size. But what I don't realize is for a player like Wood coming to Colorado for the first time, how the difference in culture is so immediately felt 
it's something that I don't know if I've given it enough consideration how significant that is, one, to build over time the way that Bednar has. We talk about it all the time because to have gone from the team that he inherited, id, inherited, id, I'm so sorry for that, <laughs> to what it is now required building a lot of blocks and laying a lot of foundation. And Jared Bednar, something that's really unique about starting this season off this way is having the team meetings where you're able to address the entire group, including AHL players and these invites, PTOs type guys. Um, in this atmosphere, we are addressing them and you're setting the tone for the year. Some of what happens is a lot of background and context. In those meetings, Jared Bednar is explaining to people that are new to Colorado how they got to this point. He points to things in the last two years that have brought them success and that he believes have brought them success. And he sort of educates, gives guys a rundown on how Colorado has been able to achieve success so far. And I just think that's really interesting to hear about um, because it, it probably is a learning lesson for players coming into Colorado for the first time. The standard that has been set here is so high and it makes it interesting and gives me a newfound appreciation for Chris McFarland and targeting players that are going to be a cultural fit because hearing how high that standard is in Colorado, I think it sets such a high bar for players to even fit in coming into this group. And it was kind of twofold, right? Because Miles Wood liked the culture. Miles Wood wanted to be a part of it. And then at the end of the summer, Tomas Tatar is still a free agent. Who do they ask about Tatar? His most recent teammate, Miles Wood. So it's it's that thing that just continues to pay over time for you. Players want to be a part of it. It's, it's opportunities to get paid for a guy like Tatar, and it's an opportunity to settle down and have a, a lengthy and secure second half of a career for a guy like Miles Wood, who's beginning a six-year deal here. So I it it's fascinating when you have it, you have it, and it's incredible. And when you don't, you're constantly chasing it. It's one of those immediate things that when, it, when an organization is not successful, it's one of the loudest conversations that you have. What's the culture like? What's the culture like? And to hear the conversations around this, the avalanche culture right now, I mean, for me, it's just warm and fuzzy because I remember the dark years. I remember what it was like when there wasn't one. When it was, yeah, they had some really talented players, but they weren't playing as a team. They didn't play together. They didn't play for one another. They played as a bunch of individuals that were cashing checks. And it felt that way. It looked that way. It felt that way. You can't hide from it. And we've seen over the last handful of years the way that that has shifted in Colorado. And I think with so much turnover from the Cup team, it's been fair to wonder how that would continue to translate into the future. No Landis Cog, at least as a daily part of the organization, in the room, on the ice. I think it's been fair to wonder how is this? How is the group that's still in there, Cogliano, McKinnon, Ranton, and McCarr, et cetera, how are they going to continue that? How are they going to build that in and instill that in all of the new guys? For So for Miles Wood to show up and be like on day one and be like, well, this is different. Like, New Jersey's great. I loved it there. They're going, they're, they're going places. This is an organization that's been places and can get there again. And so I thought that was a striking, just a striking answer. The well, a series of answers. The distinction to me that stands out too is that culture is bigger than just guys being decent people, good guys, yeah. that there has to be direction. Because even with a room full of really good guys, if they're directionless, there's no culture. And I think hearing Miles Wood talk about how he likes to see guys pulling the rope in the same direction. I think that's where him coming to Colorado is such a good fit for himself too and how he views culture because everybody is pulling the rope in the same direction and it's to a Stanley Cup. And that is the mindset of the group. They want to win. They don't know otherwise. And I think it's why Nathan McKinnon gives an answer yesterday that he enters every season with the same motivation year after year because that's just how he's wired. And the core has been the same now for for a few years, and then this continuity, right? Continuity right there. Continuity behind the bench, right? Ray Bennett, Pratter, Bedsy, mm -hmm. um, uh, Brett in the video room. Brett Heimlich. Yep. 
Brett Gretzky, Gret, whatever they call him. Gret, uh, what do they call him? They call him some, something to do with Wayne Gretzky. I don't I know, know the that. nickname. Yeah, you would I don't know. know. No, I do, I do. <laughs> what do they call him? God, I'm having a blank. Anyway, like Logan O'Connor, uh, O'Connor always calls him that. And you're like, what? Who's that? No, it's it's Brett. But uh, <laughs> um, continuity there with, with C-Mac and Joe, right? And, and and those guys work hard. Now they've earned, uh, with, with the championship, you've earned that pedigree. You've earned that Miles Wood looking into free agency and say, oh, man, I like this culture. I like what they've done. And I think it's it's a big testament to those guys, the players, the management, the coaches, the trainers, the Eagles, great place in Colorado. I mean, those guys, I, I know, you, you know, you cover a lot, Megan, but what an environment that is in, in Colorado Eagles. You know, it, it is. They're well-treated down there. It's a great ownership group. It's a solid place. Everything is on solid grounds right now here, so <coughs> that's why for Miles, but it's attractive to, to come and, and to be part of, again, who wouldn't want to play with Kel McCarr, you know, best player in the <laughs> NHL? Come on. I would. <laughs> I actually, Eric, I am curious because um, you, your career kind of had a similar. Because you come, you came from LA, yep, which was, the, they were solid. Like those Kings teams, those were good Kings teams, yep. but they weren't the Avs. Mm-hmm. And you came into Colorado right after the Cup and yep. the the year that they won the Presidents Trophy. Yep. What was like? What was that like for you walking into? Because you know you were in a pretty similar situation uh, as Miles Wood is. You know, more of a depth guy coming yep. into a completely different world. Because you were saying this morning, you can feel it. It but, is palpable. It is a it is a distinct difference. So I want to. Oh, I kind of want to hear you speak to your own experience doing this exact thing, coming somewhere else to a golden era of Avalanche hockey. And, and I played in LA. Obviously, I wasn't a rookie when I got <coughs> here. I've been in LA for a few years, but we had ch- you know champions in LA. You're talking about Wayne Gretzky and guys like that. But we yeah. we as a team had lost our way you know what i mean like it was just wasn't in sync anymore and everything was all over the map and they traded everybody from you know marty mcsorley yari curry wayne gretzky mm-hmm. rick tockett you're talking about big pillars charlie huddy grant fuhrer you guys that have won so it's not like guys that won but we just weren't in sync and it, it was just a little bit all over the place and that's how you don't get wins on the board and then i get traded here that summer they won that summer mm-hmm. And then you get here, and your first training camp, it hits you. I'm, it hits you like a Curtis McDermott punch. It does. <laughs> you know? Boom. Oh, well. and, and you're like, wow. I mean, this is like, okay, this is how we walk. This is how we do it. You know what I mean? And it's awesome. And, and it does matter. And, and, and a culture is a top guy to a bottom guy to a spare to a backup goalie to the equipment guys. So everybody buys into it. And once you do, pretty lethal. You know what I mean? Like, it's pretty lethal. I, I'll, I'll give you a little anecdote here. Like, again, I'm not going back, and it's just not about my dad. But it's, my best stories are about someone I know the, the most, which was my dad. You're talking about the Quebec Nordiques. Um, foot, Sagic. I mean, guys that you guys would know. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, a lot of names, a lot of good players. Not really going anywhere. I think we talked about it before. Just ingredients, no recipe, yeah. you know. Um, this is one thing my, my – and again – gives me pleasure to talk about my dad it does but he went this is a true story he went to like walmart whatever got all the m&ms in the world and you know and then you know those prescription bottles you get you know so he yeah. went and got 150 prescription bottles you know what i mean like from from the team doctor and everything yeah, yeah. And, and then he took all the blue m&ms in the bag or whatever it was and you know if you again i'm i'm not the best scholar but you know, M and M. If you put it upside down, it looks like a W, right? So he took <laughs> all the blue ones. W pills. <laughs> put that in there. Put the names in there. Joel Sack. It's a true story. You could ask Joel Sackick. Prescription bottle full of vitamin Ws. I love that. This is right next to the veteran sauce. I on the love shelf. this. So <laughs> but, but no, but it's a true story. But you know, it went around and. And I remember Scott Young telling me the story because Scott Young was into, like, products that he would take and, you know what I mean, vitamins and protein powders. And he was like, what is this? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> what, 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 what? they're M&Ms, you know what I mean? But <laughs> there, were vitamin, there were vitamin Ws. So we're trying to change the <clears throat> culture of the Quebec Nordiques. And everybody from coaches, trainers, front office staff, ticket salespeople, we went to everybody, gave them those things. You take one of those every day, we're going to become champions. <laughs> Because 
the the vitamin W. You know, we're winners. No more thinking like losers. And to answer your question, it's a mindset. And then with the LA Kings, I remember, I, and I'm younger, I'm in my earlier days, you're, you're, you're afraid to lose every game instead of expecting to win. And it's, it's a cliche, but it's so true. You come to the Avalanche, your first game of the year, you're expected to win. So it's a different mindset, and that's powerful. Here's the thing we're forgetting. We're forgetting the Colorado culture, okay? In New Jersey, they're like the 35th most sun in the States. All right, Colorado's top five. So make sure you're wearing your shady wear. <laughs> Anybody that saw me looking at Rudo very confused a minute ago, I was watching him Google this. <laughs> Get your shady rays at shadyrays.com. Use the DNVR code when you purchase two pairs or more. You get 50% off your entire order. They're fantastic sunglasses, mm-hmm. given five stars by over 250,000 people. AJ, I, and Megan were using ours out in Vegas. If they work there, they work anywhere. I used mine on the drive-in this morning. There you go. 7 a.m. Yep. It's uh, not a problem for me because I drive west to yeah. get here. So. Yeah, we get it. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> seriously, great sunglasses. You can get them at ShadyRays.com with the DNVR code. Or they have a brick and mortar in the Park Meadows Mall. And then the other conversation we were having, if you've had an unfortunate run-in with a Curtis McDermott <laughs> or a, maybe, a, <laughs> maybe a Jeff Carter elbow. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> Intentional, unintentional, doesn't matter. The, the, well, yeah. As long as it's not your fault, uh, Bacchus and Shanker has you covered. Call them at 222 today to get a free consultation. After they hear your consultation, if they think you have a case, you will pay nothing up front for them to take on your case. You only pay them after you win your case. So whether it is an injury in a car accident or maybe it's like a rideshare situation, uh, you're on a scooter downtown, someone at work kicked out your ladder, it happened to me. Uh, <laughs> Here? Wow. Yeah, I worked at a Bed Bath and Beyond. It was a, uh, it was an adventure. Uh, anyway, I should have called Bacchus and Shanker, but I was <laughs> a sixteen year old kid and didn't know any better. Uh, go, go, hood him up. You can also go to ColoradoLaw.net or the two number to get your free consultation. They've won over a billion dollars for their clients over the twenty five years they've been doing this, so they will, uh, they will win for you. Get their, get your vitamin W with Bacchus and Shanker. I love that story. <laughs> Uh, third period of the DNVR Avalanche podcast. Wanted to kind of con- continue through with this Wood interview. He was very quick to to give a lot of credit to the leadership in the room, that core that you were talking about, Eric. Even with no Landeskog, how much of this is on the players as opposed to it being from Bednar down? It was a big difference. Um I'm not taking away from coaches or, or what, but the pressure you have from your peers internally is a lot. It, it's a lot, and it's bigger than your coaches. Listen, your coaches, they're your coaches, and, you know, those guys get along with, with the core, get along with the players. They're good human beings, first and foremost. And if you're not a good person, then, you know, then all of a sudden your culture takes a hit, right? And guys, you know, guys talk, and then you don't want to come here. You don't want to, you know, those guys are good. But I think it's different. And, and even Gabe not being around, like, I, I think with these things nowadays, like, you're still part of a group chat. You're still part of, you know, making decisions for the group. And still his presence, he's got such charisma, and he's got that, you know, that personality that he's got it, right? You know, so I think it's important. But, but there is a difference, you know, with – uh you know your teammates and your coaches, and um, I remember talking to uh, uh, Tony Granado in Pittsburgh. Uh, he, you know he joined Pittsburgh and assistant coach, and and I'm just seeing him at morning scale one morning. He's just telling me, he goes, "This Crosby's unbelievable." You know what I mean? Like it's, he's like a coach out there. You know, it's, it's a lot like Manning or or Brady or you know, those guys just relay exactly what the coaches you know are talking about, the way they want it to be talked about, the way they want the feeling to be around the room. So I think your the relationship between the the core and the coaches is so is so important. And obviously with management, you know, they're just management's just a little different. They're not downstairs on a day to day, they are, but they're not there 24 seven like coaches are. So that's a different. Um, but it's uh, I think it's important that the core gets along, in a sense, with, with, with the coaches and, and that you're on the same wavelength there. Do you think that's also part of the value of having a guy like an Andrew Cogliano who, you know, as just as an NHL player at this point is a pretty lower-end 
yeah. guy, even in his role anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and and had kind of a tough year last year. It was, yeah. but he can be an extension of that of that coaching staff. He can be one of those guys that's really trusted and respected in the room. Absolutely, and 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 that comes with longevity. That comes with you know <laughs> yeah. consistency. And those guys have been around long enough. And and compared to you know Mike Keynes of the world or guys like that, right? They're not your best players, but when they speak, guys listen. And it's like, whoa. <clears throat> you know, if he's like, hey, hold on a second, halfway through the intermission, it carries a lot. You know what I mean? Where I don't know, where where a young guy like. You know, Bo Byron, you wouldn't see that. And I'm, I'm, Bo Byron's an outstanding player, but, I'm, you know, Bo Byron's not at that stage yet to say, hey, hold on a second. You know what I mean? Where Cogliano, even though he's not as good a player in the depth chart, yeah. you know, that he is now. So th- those guys care. You need those guys, I, and you need to have the right ones. PD said this about Brad Richardson, and I yeah. would uh, put this about Cogliano, too. He's one of the few players in the league that can still tell somebody to F off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah. I you love know. that you bring up Bo in that comparison yeah. because he recently said that Andrew Cogliano would make a great candidate for a future GM. And I asked him about it, and he was sort of cheeky in his response, but he acknowledged, like, there's a reason this 36-year-old player is still hanging around the league mm-hmm. yeah. and on this group specifically, and cited the ways in which Andrew Cogliano specifically has helped him with the mental side of the game and mm-hmm. addressing injuries away from the ice and that's the value of an Andrew Cogliano. It's like an extension of a coach. And that's why I wanted to bring up Cogliano specifically because we're not talking about Andrew Cogliano fighting for a roster spot. He's got Versus, one. Yeah. yeah, like a Curtis McDermott of like, where's the value? Mm-hmm. What's the extra? Like, yeah. what are the, the, you know, the intangibles, the stuff mm-hmm. that we can't, I, I can't pull up a, a fancy chart or graph yeah. and say, this is what this guy is all about. With an Andrew Cogliano, it's it's like with McDermott. The intangibles are great, and they're, mm-hmm. but they're very valuable in different ways. And we're not arguing about whether or not he's going to make the roster, if he's going to be in the lineup, any of that. No, the, the flubber will be there. I want to take Andrew Cogliano as we move into talking about Group 2 a little bit. There's no excuse for anybody after watching him at this training camp. <laughs> Dude broke his vertebrae four months ago, yeah. and he yeah. comes in here in the the best shape of anybody. <laughs> he they did skating at the end of training camp today. Dude wasn't even winded. He was like, "Nah, I'm good. Let's go." <laughs> and built different. Dude, the, the guy's an animal. It's <laughs> it's remarkable to watch. Yeah, but that's what you hear when being a pro, right? He's a pro, and yeah. that's preparation. You know, preparation, and and that group probably needed that. You know what I mean? When he came in, right, right before the cup run. I mean. You needed that, right? The McKinnon, those guys probably need to see that guy on a daily basis, and, and that's how you win, right? You bring those guys in, and that was a valuable. I know we talk about all the time about Lekkonen's trade and yeah. you know, all like that, yeah, but, you know, that was a slight, simple move, Cogliano, but it was an important one. I, we're talking about a lot about you know, training camp preseason. We'll be talking about a lot about roster battles. Yep. Was it interesting to anybody else that Ben Myers just gets that first look there at 4 seed? I'm, I don't think it's no. that interesting. Okay. <laughs> I, well, because I was I was curious how they would they would do Frederick Olofsson versus Ben Myers, knowing that Olofsson was the first thing they did in the off season. We've heard C Mac call him out a couple of times in a couple of different interviews yeah. over the summer, and talk about not just that, but his Olofsson's versatility. And so I was curious to see on day one. Who Jared Bender wanted the first look at between Cogliano and LOC? Because yeah. we know Cogliano and LOC, if they're both healthy, they're they should play together. They bring out the best in each other. Teams hate them. They wreak havoc together. They they're like tiny little versions of the Bash Brothers. Like they <laughs> are, they are little chaos monsters together. So who's gonna be like the bow on top of the chaos monster machine down there? And I I thought it was interesting. Ben Myers got the first look. Well, it's a long few weeks, right? I mean, yeah, I, of yeah, no, I, I know, of course. I know you know. Uh, I'm, I you know, guy was here, you know, put him I, there today, and I, from there. I do wonder if Olafson was sitting at home and saw that Tatar signing and went, huh? <laughs> I all of them did. Yeah, except yeah. Saku Mendelainen, apparently. <laughs> <Yeah>. Potentially <laughs> Miles Wood, because I thought it was interesting how Miles Wood was what was very ambiguous about what he was told he was being brought into Colorado to do yeah. and that he was told he was going to have a greater impact than what he 
was being utilized for in New Jersey. And I find that really interesting because right now we have him slotted on a third line role, and that's very mm -hmm. comparable to his role in New Jersey. Tomas Tatar, I wonder because that did happen so late and that was somebody that was a dream player that they didn't necessarily envision when they were constructing their top nine with Miles Wood in, in mind, if that changes things for Miles Wood at all, if Miles Wood was among the players to go, oh, shoot, <laughs> but also, great, that's my friend, we personally know each other, when he saw Tomas Tatar get signed. I was just very curious to hear how Miles Wood talked about the opportunity and how it was presented to him in Colorado. I do... I think he didn't really get into it, but I think it ended in New Jersey and kind of a. I got that impression. No, nah, like the, he was when he was like, um, I don't like change, but also I was happy to leave. <laughs> that's right. that, like those, that combination of sentiments is like that's a guy that just needed a, a fresh start somewhere else. I fully else. agree. Yeah, because you know getting healthy scratch in the postseason is not going to be a thing that makes a player feel very good. So, yeah. um, him being here and being like, oh yeah, by the way. This guy that scored 20 goals on your team last year? Yeah, now you're line mates with him. <laughs> this guy that's been winning Stanley Cups in Tampa Bay the last couple of years? Oh, by the way, you're line mates with that guy now. You know, like I... Day one, I feel like Miles Wood has to feel pretty good. Well, and he oh, yeah. kept talking about how much Colorado saw after him. And yeah. I'm just really glad to hear that. I think that has to feel really good on a personal level for Miles Wood to own that. 100%. Uh Definitely. Uh, the big story out of group two, that was the one Val Nachushkin was skating in. Megan, you were in the room for that. Not that we... But I... Barely. I, uh, yeah. I mean, I'll let you explain yeah. it since you were there. Man, I mean, I was at the tail end. There's a train of media waiting to go into the room before it opens. Mm -hmm. We're all lined up for the same reason. I get in once they open the room, and he's already begun speaking. I've missed half of it. So I'm a little disappointed that even though I was there, as soon as the door opened, it was just yeah. a few line of people ahead of me that meant not hearing part of that availability. And my takeaways from it and hearing the end of it and talking to people who were closer and able to ask questions is that there isn't very much valuable in information to take away from it. And it's tough because I want to be realistic in what my expectation was for Val's availability. I didn't have high expectation, but this still fell below it in my eyes just because, one, not everyone was even in the room and half the interview was done. Yeah. Um, and I don't know who to pin this on, but Val Nichushkin leaned on the fact that the team had already issued a statement that this was related to personal reasons and pointed back to that as we've already addressed this. We've already spoken about it. When the we is the team statement from the past. And so it just wasn't really anything new coming directly from Val to add color to the situation. And again, my expectations were very low going into this, but it still fell just a bit below what I had hoped. Um, because now we're in a similar position as we were 24 hours ago before we talked to Val Nichushkin. I felt the answers from Kale McCarr and Nathan McKinnon yesterday provided more insight than Val Nichushkin himself. And I just think that there was maybe a little bit more that could have been done to offer insight into what happened without delving too deeply into the personal details of what happened to lay to rest some of the speculation that surrounds Val because the ambiguity of it all has left room for sinister doubt. And with everything that I know to be true of what happened, I don't think that is necessary and could be alleviated, but it would require just a little bit more. And it, it puts everybody in a really tough spot. It, it keeps the organization in the same difficult place as they were before. I think it now is still a little bit of a distraction moving through camp. I imagine there's a lot of people who want to talk to other players and teammates about the situation because they're unsatisfied with what we've gotten so far. And it's tough because I don't feel personally obligated to much more. I was on the phone with Seattle PD this summer, and I was among the first to learn that there wasn't a criminal investigation yeah. at all. Not even just specifically into Val Nichushkin. The league obviously conducted their investigation yeah. with the help of Seattle PD as well. And so we know all of that to be true, but understandably there were still some questions left on the table that are just still there unanswered. And 
it's tough because we are the conduit between what we know to have happened and yeah. the public eye, and we're supposed to help bridge that gap, but I still don't feel like I'm in a place where I can comfortably do that. I think the part about what Val said today was that it did feel like he took full ownership of it. And I think that's where he kind of left me lacking a little bit because I I fully expected more or less the statement that he gave. But I it was a lot of like, oh, this happened and, you know, I'm moving forward and it was a personal issue and, you know, I'm I'm just not going to get into the past of it. And it didn't... I guess for me, I wasn't expecting a pound of flesh or anything, right? Like, I wasn't... He wasn't going to come out and be like, blow by blow. Like, here's what happened that crazy no. night. But... And, and so I think there was always going to be a feeling of, like, unsatisfaction uh, at the end of it. Definitely. But I think the part that it just didn't sit great with me was and i want to go back and i want to watch and listen and read and read through you know all of it again but it it felt to me like he left a lot of it on the table of like yeah we've made this statement you know we i'm just not looking into the past as much about it i'm i'm here i'm excited to be here i'm looking you know i'm I'm moving forward with it instead of a instead of a you know I really let everybody around me down. I'm sorry. I I made I you know I made obviously I made mistakes that night. You know what whatever, whatever right? And that felt lacking to me. Just the just the looking in looking somebody in the eye, looking into a camera, and just saying I made a mistake. I am sorry. And I, and for me it would have felt like I would have been like great. That's what I was expected. Yet let's move on. And it didn't feel so much that way today the thing that i wanted to take away from this in trying to set my expectation realistically was an acknowledgement that he got support that he needed to be able to move on from this he yeah. alluded to support from his teammates sort of in present day which we're vaguely aware of in hearing from mckinnon and mccarr that they've reconnected but i just really wanted to hear with more assurance that he sought out the support that he needed to overcome the personal issues of this summer and is now in a better place, you yeah. know, that this has been resolved. And that's where I was left wanting specifically. Yeah. I'm okay. I think that was a good conversation about it. <laughs> anyway, we're probably done with it now um, because we're moving forward and we don't look into the past. Yep. And that's, I, I think, the reality of the situation is we probably won't get any more out of it at this point no and and like the organization deferring and being like you know they for one they they set jared bender up to fail during the playoffs sure with the way that it got handled it very much felt like bender was the one who had to continue to answer it and be the fall guy yep okay and then over the summer it was like look we said all we're going to say about it next the next update on this is whatever val wants to say and val just referred back to the team statement essentially yeah, yeah. it just look for me it's just not gonna and, and as a person who's been like look we have a pretty good idea of things that went on yep you know and we're respecting the privacy of a it's a personal issue True. and and we all we all accept that and i have no issues with that i don't feel like the general public deserves to know the nitty gritty of that night. Yeah. I think I think that that's just kind of the uh, you know, just the world that we love like we we are so accustomed to having that information now about all these things that we think we're owed that. And I don't think that's true. But it did today, I guess I just I I'm, I'm uncomfortable feeling like this is the end of it. And this is a situation I've been pretty comfortable with for basically it, since it yeah. happened. And now, now I'm uncomfortable with it because it's now it's just like, oh, we're all just moving on. And I, 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 I don't know. I'm just going to let it be. But I just, yeah, I'll, yeah I'm good. Uh, I'm just making noise now. We can move on uh, from it. it. The situation is what it is. Nothing we're going to do is going to change it. So um, we do have to wrap up the show today, though. Uh, we are brought to you by Breckenridge Brewery, the official beer of DNVR. You can get yours oh. on tap at the local liquor it's store. Long show. Sorry. Yeah, I know. We've we've been. Uh, hey, look, it's training camp. We we're going in. All right, yeah. that's that's how it is. Uh, get your Breck Brew online at breckbrew.com to find it at a local liquor store near you. Use the Breck Beer locator. 
And if you want some Avalanche merch, you can go to FOCO.com, whether it's licensed apparel, bobbleheads, all sorts of other stuff. Uh, highly recommend you check them out. You get in there. You find whatever it is you might like, whether it's the, the clothes, the pins, the bobbleheads, the Crocs, the pullover thing, blanket, hoodie, that thing too. Get it at FOCO.com. Use code DNVR when you check out at FOCO to get 10% off your order. That's it for today. We're going to wrap this one up since we've been live for a very long time. But we will have more coming to you from day two of training camp tomorrow. More interviews, more talk of the position battles as they do start to shake out a little bit more over the next couple of days. Keep it tuned into that. And then we got you covered for the uh, first preseason game of the year, too. So we appreciate y'all. Give us a like, subscribe here to DNVR on YouTube. Check us out on the DNVR.com. Lots of content coming y'all's way, whether it be uh, Megan's interviews or my vlogs or written pieces, you name it. <laughs> Whatever else. We, we, uh, we're full bore at this point. Lots more content to come. We appreciate y'all, and we will see you tomorrow.